1966. 1966. Mighty trip to the Dubont and Thielen Rivers in Canada. This is going to be part two. Uh, getting from California up to Cary Lake in the Northwest Territories. And this slide that I'm using for my title slide, I don't think I use it anywhere else in the talks. Uh, we're past the tree line, obviously. It's been a long day. And there I am with my life preserver on, uh, just exhausted with the paddling. So I hope you've gone through part one. It sets up the other parts. Uh, I discussed the Moffat expedition that went through 11 years before we did uh, along this route and in which the leader, Art Moffat, died of exposure. Um, and you can see the four parts here. We are in the second part. I'm dedicating this video, these videos, to all those who pursue science as a way of increasing our collective knowledge about the world and our place in it. So this is what we're going to cover in part two. Uh, our equipment, my personal gear, uh, the tent we used, emergency radio, navigational tools, uh, how we uh, packed and shipped all our stuff to Prince Albert, uh, the rental of the canoes, and a little bit about lining uh, these, uh, these, the Dubon River, temperatures during our trip, and then how we got from UC Riverside uh, to uh, Regina, Prince Albert, Stony Rapids, and then eventually the first uh, stop on the Dubon River, which is Waldia Lake. My City College of New York background and my, uh, uh, my mentor there, Dr. Alexander Klotz, insect collection, Waldia Lake biota, leaving food behind that first day that we left that lake. First emergency campsite, Hindi Lake, fishing, biota, going north, ice impact on rocks, wind hazards on lakes, and then living off the land. So we have a lot to cover. Let's talk about the equipment. And <clears throat> the more we take, the more we carry the less space in the canoes for us. As I've told you, uh, I came aboard about a month and a half before they left for Canada, the group, and wasn't really involved in much of the planning. Uh, I was involved in the packing, however. And as far as the personal gear was concerned, that uh, this is from my journal. On May 25th, 1966, I'm in, I'm in uh, Riverside, California. And I indicate that last week I started to get my gear in order. There are two problems, actually, more than two problems. Avoid the windy, rainy, cold conditions. That'll be occasional. And avoid insects. That's one major little area. And another problem is our plan to rope down the canoes at each rapid. I must have misheard them, actually, because if we did that, we'd probably still be up there. But a lot of roping. This may mean immersing in water up to our waist, too cold. We are trying to figure out some way of remaining dry, and uh, we actually haven't figured that out yet. Last week, I spent over $200 on personal gear, uh, and that's really personal gear. My outfit should come to over $300. Remember, we're talking 1966. So uh, we had an uh, idea we were going to be running rapids. Just so you understand, the rapid is a fast flowing and turbulent part of the course of a river. And the trick is to remain upright in your canoe when you do that. Appendix two in part four of this series, I'm going to show you a list. Uh, my journal is filled with lists uh, of what I took. I think you might appreciate that. And $300 for personal equipment in 1966 uh, is equivalent to a buying power of over $2,500. I didn't want to come underprepared. Uh, given the example of the Moffat expedition, um, and it looked like they weren't prepared for um, their cold conditions, uh, I decided that uh, better be safe and spend the money. 
the group gear. Well, the Don Chant had bought a tent, an unbelievable looking tent, which is here. I'll show you more about the area it's in. And this tent uh, we put up at the uh, UC Riverside. That must have been a spectacle for the students. We put it up outside on the lawn of the entomology building and we couldn't find the directions. You know, all the these PhD and grad students until we put up the tent and, and uh, found them under the floor of the tent. Great. The tent cost $437 and is made of a silk-like material. It's a double layered tent with an outside fly. And uh, we didn't need an outside fly, as you'll see, there'll be flies all over the place where we went. In addition, a vestibule can be put on the sides. According to the manufacturer, it can sleep six. And uh, looking at my inflation calculator, that $437 tent would cost about $3,600 today in 2021 dollars. We'll see how it withstands uh, the barren grounds weather. We are able to get an emergency radio. Now the, the Moffitt uh, group all tried very hard to get an emergency radio and his uh, request for a permit was denied by the Canadian government. So I don't know uh, whether we got the radio because uh, Jim Chilcott was an employee of the Agricultural Department of Canada or not, but we had one with us. We had a medical kit that the uh, UC medical group uh, prepared for us. We didn't really need it very much. And we certainly had uh, Terrell's survey information that we talked about in the uh, first video. We also had aerial photographs uh, of the route and uh, we and the Thumb Party, which was the party that uh, preceded us, came directly in front of us in 1966, had aerial photos of the route available from the Canadian government. I don't know if those photos were available in 1955 for the Moffat Party. And since they bragged basically that they were going to be minimalistic, uh, in the, the material and the gear they brought with us, whether they would have even, even used them. So here we are on June 12th. I'm at UC Riverside uh, and all the equipment is coming in to the entomology area. So we're packing it away. Finished packing Friday night, eight five cubic feet cartons and five or six pack sacks. How are we going to get all this stuff in a canoe is a good question. And of course, the answer to that is we're not going to. But we didn't realize it at the time. Regular packs haven't come yet, so we're going to have to repack them. Received airline tickets June 24th, take a helicopter into Los Angeles, United to Vancouver, Air Canada to Regina. We'll meet Roger at Vancouver after driving him to Ontario, now Ontario Airport is in Southern California on Wednesday evening. 6.15, still at Riverside. Our pack sacks came yesterday and we were up to 2.30 in the morning repacking all our gear. That's all we seem to be doing, packing and repacking from cartons to the sacks. It is all finished now. The gear leaves this afternoon for Los Angeles and then to Prince Albert. Even the 70 to 80 pound packs were manageable once they were on one's shoulders. Well, yeah, they're manageable when you're walking flat corridors of buildings. Uh, I don't think we walked up and down stairs. Uh, when you're going on a two mile portage where there are rocks and wet spots and it may not be so easy. And we'll go into that when we get to the Grant Lake Portage. At Stony Rapids in Saskatchewan, we picked up two 17-foot canoes that were rented that were about 75 pounds each. And you can see from this slide that I took of the, hunting, the uh, Hudson Bay Company U-Paddle canoe, aluminum canoes. We had a riveting set with us and we actually had to use it uh, to replace some of the rivets.
I want to show you this canoe and uh, make some comments about this. You'll see this slide later with uh, Jim Chilcott there. But it's obvious that we are top loaded. Uh, there's not much space for us. Made the canoes difficult to maneuver and very cautious about, about preventing from rolling it. The other thing I want you to notice is the amount of rope that we had on the front and the back of the canoe. And here is some uh, notes from July 6 in my journal. The canoeing isn't too bad. Jim is my partner and I, f I feel he takes, if allowed, too many risks. Remember, I'm a novice here. This is my first uh, paddling journey, period. Many of the rapids he thought runnable, I would not do. Lining down isn't bad, except for the wear and tear in one's ankles. Large slippery rocks with deep holes between them doesn't help. So what we did was we did a lot of walking with the canoes. Uh, with a person in the river on the front and back of the canoe, we weren't in the canoe, moving the canoe downstream with better control of its motion. Or we use ropes, lining the canoe with ropes on the front and back of the canoe, and two people walking on the shore or in the shallows let the current move the canoe. And uh, giving you a reference there, The Art of Lining a Canoe by Kevin Callan, who says you walk it down like a pet dog. We did a lot of lining. And what surprised me is when I looked at the Moffat party, um, which came 11 years before us, that reading through the books and journal entries and magazine articles uh, that I recently accumulated on that, I can't remember reading any reference to them walking or lining canoes along their route. Um, uh, it's strange, maybe they didn't use that, that technique. We use it extensively. So here's my journal entry for July 8th. Um, and uh, uh, again, for lining, we left camp yesterday about 9.30 a.m. and paddled till about 9.30 p.m. That's 12 hours. But we only made probably 10 miles. Why? The going was rough because we had to walk the canoes down. At one point, by brute force, we pulled the canoes through a shallow area. Another time, we had to lower her gently through a chute of water the only problem with walking the canoes is persistent wet clothing. And Jim, unfortunately, went under once due partly to my inexperience. So he got the short end of the straw with me. Now, I'm not quite sure where this slide was taken. It was taken on the trip. But just to show you that uh, uh, waters can be pretty rough. And he's looking at uh, some area that probably we're going to... Uh, uh, try and force the canoe uh, over that area without being in the canoe itself. Now, one of the things I regret not doing is recording air and water temperature every day during the trip. It would be very interesting. Um, I did have some uh, expensive um, uh, thermometers with me. They're called Schultheis thermometers. They're calibrated. And going through the journal, this is the only uh, air and water temperature that I, I got. Um, at air and you know July we had temperatures of 90 during the day and then two months later we have freezing at night. The summer is very short in the subarctic areas. If you look at Dubunt Lake, um, the thumb party that preceded us were there probably about two weeks earlier than we were in the middle of July. And they were held up by ice uh, on this lake for three days. Well, when we went, there was practically no ice there. And the waters were comfortable, at least, 48 degrees. Uh, so uh, we didn't experience really cold conditions until the very end of the trip. So let me take you from the University of California Riverside to Prince Albert in Canada. I'm going to use Google Earth to uh, uh, take you on uh, a magical trip uh, to get you from the Riverside UC campus all the way up to, to at least Prince Albert. Um, and uh, actually, I think we're going to stop 
at uh, Regina first. So I'm going to uh, rotate the, the earth a little bit. That solid yellow we looked at on the uh, part one of the video, the other dots there uh, are going to be places that we're going to uh, take a magic helicopter to. So I come over to the left side and I'm going to press the play tour and we'll do a little bit of the play tour uh, situation. Um, it gets a little bit up and down. So if you get motion sickness, I don't blame you. University of California Riverside is in a semi-arid area. It's where all the planning was done and the equipment came. And then I took a helicopter to uh, Los Angeles Airport. Obviously, the base map here is 2020, 2021, not 1966. Then took a plane. It was not nonstop. So I stopped off at Seattle, maybe San Francisco too. And I uh, met uh, uh, Roger at the Vancouver Airport. And together we both flew uh, all the way to um, uh, Regina uh, over there picked up a, a rental vehicle, and then for two days collected uh, mites and amphibians uh, on our way to Prince Albert. And this is all prairie. So we're going to go through a prairie. We're going to go through boreal forest, and we're going to go through tundra. Okay. So here we are at uh, Prince Albert, June 28th from my journal. After a hectic two days of collecting mites and frogs, interesting pair, uh, between Regina and Prince Albert, we picked up Don Chant and Jim Chilcott at the uh, Prince Albert Airport. We found, however, that our gear, all that gear that we packed, had not arrived yet uh, from Riverside. So today, today, we were lucky with there at least, we had to go down to Saskatoon to pick up our gear at some warehouse. Uh, it should have arrived at Prince Albert. So we were really lucky then in that regard. Maybe we can still make the 1030 flight to Stony Rapids tomorrow. And this is actually a similar situation that the Moffat party had. And I'll explain that next. Our gear weighed 1,200 pounds. And actually, um, when we left Stony Rapids to get to our first destination, uh, they weighed the gear at 1,350. So, and, and even at Prince Albert, we decided we had too much gear. So we cut out 60 pounds of candy and milk from our camp goods. That wasn't enough, actually. In terms of the Moffat party that I've been following throughout these uh, talks, uh, this is 1955. Uh, Art expected his trip food order would arrive on time at Stony Rapids. It did not come. He canceled the order and he scrounged for supplies. And we're talking six people for 80 days and not that easy. And Skip, one of the people in the party, second in command, uh, in the preface of his book indicated Art wanted to run his trip without outside technical support. He wanted to be very independent. Apparently the comment below from our bush pilot taking us back to Stony Rapids from Aberdeen Lake can be understood in that context. People wanted to help him. So Sam remembers Moffat, 11 years later, charged each member of the party $600 for the trip. Obstinate guy who would not accept food or advice from Sam, although down on food. And I wondered for years about that $600 charge uh, that uh, Sam uh, uh, was so adamant about. Uh, Art, when he uh, recruited people, uh, told them up front that uh, they would need $600 for their share of the uh, airfare, share of the food, share of the cost of the canoe, etc. So he was very much up front, uh, and it was a perfectly legitimate uh, request. And I think all the people that went on his uh, uh, group uh, could easily afford that, or their parents could afford that money. Okay, so... We're at Prince Albert, we're antsy, we want to get to Stony Rapids with our gear. So let's take our magic helicopter uh, from the plains of, uh, uh, of uh, Prince Albert and uh, the, uh, the farming communities. 
all the way up through boreal forests, and we're starting to see more and more water up to Stony Rapids. On 629, after a one and a half hour wait, we took off from Prince Albert in a DC-3 for Stony Rapids. Now, I, now I've always had been uh, motion sick, sickness. Even when in New York City, we would go up to uh, uh, the Catskills uh, for the summer. And, you know, the old Woody would pick us up. I would I really get sick that way. So the, so the trip for me, that DC-3, was mildly rough. The air company took out many of the seats to fit in our luggage. That's how we got our luggage up there. Stony Rapids contains about 100 people, mostly Indians. Black Lake, 16 miles away, uh, in 1966, had about 350 Indians. And my journal indicates that these people, uh, uh, at least during uh, some seasons, live off the land, hunting and trapping. Fur, pelt, fur pelts can bring in high prices, at least at the auction places. I found this uh, uh, picture of a DC-3 online. Well, we're still there. It's, it's June 30th. We are still at Stony Rapids. Hope to fly out today. But the weather closed in and rain fell. We did get in some canoeing. We did uh, on, on next to Stony Rapid. And also played some bridge. Now, we all knew how to play bridge. And so the group of us uh, on, on down days uh, when it's very windy, uh, we did a lot of reading, but we did things together. And uh, from what I can see from the Moffat party, uh, Art and Skip would go off and do uh, their, uh, um, their filming. And the rest of the people didn't seem to be able to do anything. There no group efforts. The only thing they seemed to do was when they uh, met for uh, meals or they paddled. But we did have uh, a number of interactions uh, outside of collecting. So the waiting around is not very pleasant. We're field biologists. We want to get in the field. All of us probably want to be in the field already. Tomorrow, weather permitting, we will fly into Waldia Lake. Now, I think I told you that uh, my, my uh, canoeing partner, uh, Jim Chilcott died on his next field trip to the Himalayas. We'll talk about that on the fourth, um, the fourth video when I tell you what happened to each of us. But as part of the obituary, the person who knew him well had received a letter from him on 1st of July, 1966. And he's at Stony Rapids. I want to read you that. So this is from his obituary. And finally, in 1966, Jim, back to his first love, the Arctic, actually subarctic, to make collections while canoeing with a party down the Dubant River. It was like old times, and the enjoyment of roughing it was again with him when he wrote to me on 1 July, just a note to say that after a day of bad weather spent in an abandoned back corner of a radio shack, and two nights in a sleeping bag on Bear Slat Springs. I'm on my way up with the last of three flights, taking our gear the 115 miles to Waldia Lake. So here we are at Stony Rapids, June 1966, getting ready to get up to the lake country. And I've showed you this before in part one. Don Chant is on the left. Roger Hansel is graduate student. And Jim Chilcott. And as a photographer, I'm very few of these photographs. Unless I ask people to take my picture. And we went into Woldia Lake in July 1st. And we stayed there through the 5th. So let's take our magic helicopter ride this 115 miles and uh, the area is going to change there's going to be a lot more lakes a number of them are named all the way up to Waldia Lake and actually we're going to be at the outlet which is just on the upper right we're not going to be in this area 
we're going to be deposited way up here. Okay. Took three uh, flights to get us there. One Cessna and two Beaver. And so we leave the spruce forest here thinking we're going to be on Tundra, basically. Or now, actually, we thought we would be in spruce forest still. We ended up on Tundra. And you can see that the uh, canoe has been lashed to the pontoon there. Uh, we start moving away from Stony Rapids. You can see some of the houses down there. It's taking pictures. Boreal Forest. We expected to see that uh, at, the, at the lake. And then it opens up and becomes a lot more water. You, know, you, you might wonder how we can navigate through something like this. And uh, the tarot material is very good. So is the aerial photographs. Uh, so we did well with that. And so here I am the next day at Woldia Lake. I am writing this among the din of black flies hitting the sides of the tent. It sounds like there is a heavy rain outside. Incredible. So talking about the first, after some early morning doubt about weather conditions, we were flown into Woldia Lake by two beaver trips and one Cessna. The ride was smoother than I thought and the view impressive. And I took many pictures of this lakey area, of which only two slides remain, only the two that you saw. We set up camp under rainy skies. We were surprised to see patches of tundra at this location. And we set up camp on a tundra patch. Now I'm going to show you a little bit about my background. And, and uh, I brought back a small insect collection. And I want to make sure, sure that you understand uh, that even though I'm not an entomologist, I did have some background in entomology because I graduated from CCNY. I have this sweatshirt I was given. Never underestimate an old man who graduated from the City College of New York. And there is uh, my uh, little uh, uh, summary that's in the yearbook. Uh, Joel Weintraub, BS in Biology, Biological Society, Interscience Council, Bridge Club, you can see that, Bridge Club, that became useful. Uh, House Plan, Remsen 63 Social Chairman. Uh, and then uh, I think two honorary science societies. And my mentor, my undergraduate mentor at City College of New York was an entomologist. He put me on the path to becoming a professional field biologist. His name was Alexander Klotz. He wrote The Field Guide to Butterflies. Uh, and he taught a field biology course that was delightful. And people would actually go in the field and away from the city. And I can remember going to the Pine Barrens of New Jersey with that group. Turned over a log. There was a bee colony under it. And as the bees, angry bees came out um, and the class started to scatter, I can still hear Klotz yelling to us, collect them, collect them. He was quite a character. He retired in 1965. And I found out in preparing this talk that he actually wrote a kid's book uh, in 1966 on life in the Arctic. Uh, kind of neat uh, that my old professor uh, and I both have, uh, art, you know, sub-Arctic experience the same year. So. Uh, Alexander Klotz was an important person in my background. And as part of that field course, we did a lot of, uh, we, I think we had to submit a small insect uh, collection. So I want to show you my collection. Um, you see it? You see my collection? Right there, right there. Although it's not, not what Klotz would recommend, uh, but that's a black fly. And I got lots of black fly little dots in my journal. You want to see another one of my prize collections of insects? Right there, right there. Let's look at that one. Uh, that's a mosquito. Black flies during the day, mosquitoes at night. If you hit it right. Uh, the seasons are short 
And as we went north, we seemed to hit the peak of both black flies and mosquitoes in lots of places we went. When the Moffat Party got to Waldia Lake, they got to it on July 17th. That was 16 days after our arrival date. Uh, and then uh, they even lagged farther behind when we got to Marjorie Lake on August 19th. They didn't reach that until September 14th. Uh, they have comments and Frank's journal comment and, and, and Pestle's book. Pestle's book is very good because there's lots of journals and there's lots of description about the places they went to. A lot better than what I did. Uh, Frank said uh, about uh, Waldia Lake, the whole place was delightful. It certainly looked pretty. It was windblown enough so that there were no black flies or mosquitoes. In fact, flies have been very scarce for the last two weeks because it was later in the season for them uh, in terms of those insects. So here we are. The tent is uh, at Waldia Lake. It's on tundra. Where is the boreal coniferous forest? It's on the edges. Now, I want you to see that Don Chant is wearing an insect head net. Ch Chilcott is an expert on flies. And I don't know whether it's a matter of pride or not. He rarely wore a insect net. I only saw it wear it once actually. Where the forest is, is on the edges of this lake. Now for those of you who weren't even born in 1966 uh, and might look at this scene, I want to emphasize to you that that's not a cell phone tower. Not a cell phone tower. My journal indicates that the shoreline was lined with spruce forest about 50 to 150 foot wide strip. The interior is tundra heath, surface uneven with frequent watery depressions. I didn't catch any mammals on my trap line. In fact, mammal uh, diversity populations were very low. Signs of caribou all around. There's also signs of human, um, uh, you know, influence with an old cache up at the point. And this repeats it. This is July 3rd at Waldia. Tent is located on tundra field. Permafrost, yeah, and we'll define that, is not over a foot down. This area is covered with soft heath. Standing water is present. The tent is about one block. There's my city background from the lake. And it's very noticeable. In fact, a plane, a, uh, you know, a uh, uh, probably a beaver or something like that, came down yesterday and visited us after seeing our red and white tent. It stood out. So far, most of our meals have come from the land. The land is two-dimensional. So if I want to find bird nests, I have to be very patient. And I was patient enough to see this Harris sparrow nest uh, in the tundra. So here's another journal entry on July 2nd. This morning we repacked our gear, we seem to be doing that a lot, into weekly food rations. The afternoon was spent in fishing with lake trout of about eight pounds, easy to come by. After a trout supper, we went fishing again at the outlet of the lake. Remember, we were at the very top of the lake. Northern pike of about eight pounds were caught. Sometimes every cast would bring in a fish. I didn't like that actually. These fish should have put up more of a fight. Now I'm a saltwater fisherman, so maybe my gear was a little bit uh, uh, not light. It wasn't a light gear. The anticipation of getting a strike was also missing. I was getting a strike on every cast. So let's leave Waldia Lake on our way up north. We're not quite gonna get to carry um, as we go through. And I'll show you this with maps. Uh, so there's a uh, Woldia Lake uh, on the left. Uh, Hindi Lake is the next one. You can see the Dubon River is a little clearer here than on the um, uh, the Google Earth uh, Pro. If I go up here, Boyd Lake is up there, up higher. 
Barlow, and then Cary. We're going to go through some of those lakes. Certainly don't have any slides to do a travel log. Uh, if you follow the arrow, uh, there is Mosquito Lake, but I claim that any one of these lakes could be called Mosquito Lake. So leaving Woldia was a difficult day. July 5th. I'm writing this at an emergency camp overlooking our third rapid. The day started at Woldia Lake when we attempted to pack the canoes. Big surprise. There was so much gear we had to cut down on our food supplies. From nine packs of food, we went down to four and also left behind three gallon tins of detergent, oil, and fuel. You notice we didn't leave our equipment. That's what we came for, our collecting equipment. We must have cut over 250 pounds off of our uh, of our year. The food we placed in pack sacks and left on the beach. And when we were picked up uh, in August, we let the, um, uh, the bush pilot know where to pick up that food so they could distribute it so it wouldn't go to waste. And so here's a picture of the packed canoes. No space for us. And uh, on the bottom right, you can see that wavy stuff. That's what happens when film goes underwater and the emulsion starts to peel off. Left a lot of food behind, just like uh, the Moffat uh, party. Uh, we started off with negative food resources. The third part of the, the day, the third rapids, uh, we looked at what um, Terrell said. And Terrell said, from the northwestern side of the Little Lake, which is Waldia, the river flows as a rapid stream, 250 yards wide with an even bed of boulders. You ever see a bed of boulders? But so shallow that on the 25th of July, there was not water enough for the canoes. Well, this looks like an easy thing to run. You know, shallow, 250 yards wide. So, journal, July 5th. Canoeing wasn't bad at first that day. We ran the first rapid at the outlet of Waldia, and Jim and I ran on a rock only once. Well, all right, that, you know, happens. The lakes here can be very shallow with large rocks, and our canoe as well as the other sometimes were hung up on a rock. The second rapid we walked down, one person at the stern and front of the canoe in the water. The rocks are overgrown with green algae, and this made traction very difficult. The rapid wasn't very long. The third rapid, that's the killer, is listed by Terrell as a rapid, shallow stream. We couldn't get a very good look at it, since willows and a swamp area were present at the beginning and mass style view. You know, first day, everybody's comfortable, we're all relatively dry. We're kind of lazy. We decided to trust Tyrrell and started down. That was a mistake. You know, our safety is not dependent on somebody 60 years earlier telling us uh, what the situation is, water levels change, and our ability um, may differ from one group to another. Don and Roger in front. About 10 minutes later, we entered the rapids. So at least we did it a little bit apart. Don and Roger met trouble almost at once. Their craft turned around and finally overturned. It just wasn't swamped. We fared no better. Our canoe, after getting about, I don't know whether that's 50 feet or 150, wedged sideways in some rocks. You can see the current coming from the top. Uh, or actually, no, the current's coming uh, from the bottom of the page up. The side toward, toward the current was low and water flooded the, the craft and we just just stayed in the canoe. Uh, this happened another time and you'll, you'll see what we did then. But this time it caught us by surprise. In the meantime, Roger had taken off downstream on foot to search for the aerial photos. Don had started unloading near shore of the aircraft while Jim and I tried to get out of our predicament. Finally, with Don's help, we tilted the canoe the other way 
emptied the water and managed to get it near shore from a point 40 feet out. The muscle work was mainly dons and gyms. And our four food packs, two were dry and half of the third was okay. The plastic bags that we put food in were ineffective, keeping water out of the food, and at present they are hopefully drying nearby. Roger managed to get the photos and the geo map of the route which were with them and should have been transferred elsewhere. He had to swim the rapids. This is all the first day of canoeing to retrieve the photos. Good for him. Without that packet, we would really be in bad shape. My personal gear came through okay, except for the possible loss of the gun stock for the scope. Actually, we found it later. But my plastic bags held beautifully, and the scope and camera were not damaged. Right now, we are relaxing and drawing off. So, we started out with getting rid of food, and we got more problems that first day. Our next stop was Hindi Lake. This is a delightful campsite. Not a sight of tundra around. A mature spruce forest. Hindi Lake is a very nice location for a campsite. It's a mature spruce forest with often a sandy shore. Near our campsite are signs of caribou, bear, and probably wolf according to Don. And about permafrost, remember we talked about permafrost at Woldia. So permafrost is a thick subsurface layer of soil that remains frozen throughout the year. At Woldia Lake in that tundra patch, I could dig down and about a foot and a half down, the ground was frozen. But in Hindi Lake, I couldn't breach that. I couldn't reach the permafrost layer. And you know, if there was one there, you wouldn't have had a spruce forest. 710. Yesterday went pretty much like the day before. Two unusual things stand out. About two miles from our campsite and we're at Hindi, Don found an old encampment. There were many signs of crude canvas or possibly fur or vegetation lined buildings. In addition, two pretty rugged cabins were found as well as a place for dogs. So we speculated that either there was a small Hudson Bay Company outpost or it might be a mission. While at this area, Jim discovered some, some of my frogs I was looking for, Rhinus sylvatica. I collected a small sample in a weedy area near the camp. And uh, as I indicated on the uh, first uh, um, video, I have limited slides that remain and uh, luckily there are some pictures on the Riverside Press Enterprise story about us. So here we have one of the pictures in uh, on that uh, newspaper from December 4th, 1966. And the caption reads, 30 cabin at Hindi Lake is a symbol of man's unsuccessful effort to civilize Canada's outback. UCR graduate student Roger Hansel holds a handmade saw found in the ruins. Uh, I'm not sure it was uh, trying to civilize uh, Canada's outback, outback, but in that article, Chan said that the only spot they visited, we visited, he would like to see again was Hindi Lake, a beautiful fishing paradise below the tree line where the fish hit so hard he landed all he could handle in 30 minutes without moving my feet. Chant and Arden Fisherman said the grayling, a relatively small fish, is one of the great fighters giving the angler a monumental battle on light tackle. So obviously I didn't have light tackle. So you want to see one of the fish that I, 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 um, uh, I caught? Well, this is one of my prized fish. Here I am. I was 12 years old in 1954, and look at look at that fish I got. Uh, it looks like a northern pike. Isn't that neat? Now let's add 12 years to my age, and 12 years to the date to go up to 1966, and at Hindi Lake, I got this northern pike, and I had uh, someone take my picture. I want you to notice some things here. 
uh, my life preserver because I can only pretty much dog paddle and proper way of wearing socks over pants so that black flies don't crawl up your leg and my left leg uh, is uh, is open for damage so let's continue on our way to Cary Lake we're not going to quite get there uh, on this particular part of the video as we go farther north the spruce trees get smaller and the caption to this uh, uh, is on the Santa Cruz Sentinel newspaper that ran the story is Dr. Jim Chilcott one of four scientists who made a dangerous 400 mile journey down the Dubont River in Canada's subarctic or actually Northwest Territories ropes down cargo in a canoe so heavily laden that it only has two inches of freeboard in calm water. The scientists from the University of California at Riverside made the trip to seek tiny insect like predaceous mites. So as we're going along in this stretch in Boyd Lake, for instance, the approach are filled with rocks and most of the islands there have rock edges and Jim thought that the pressure on the ice during the winter forces the rocks ashore. And uh, another thing in, in, the, in this journal is I'm writing this close to midnight with no need of a light source. Sunset was about 10.30 p.m. Probably sunrise is maybe 2.30 a.m. Well, the next day, large boulders are lining the tree shore, and we found our way blocked in one of the arms of the lake by a line of these rocks between two islands. The photo photograph didn't show the blockage, but from one winter to the next, the ice moved it so it was blocked. And that happened again at uh, Dubont Lake. We actually had to portage over that because we had gone too far to try and repeat uh, ourselves. Wind could be a problem. It's July 17th. We then set off and ate lunch before a four mile open stretch of lake. So lake uh, canoeing is quite different than, uh, than uh, river. The wind picked up and was from the north directly in our faces. The shoreline was devoid of large trees and I would swear it was receding as fast as we were paddling towards it. Soon we changed our course and found ourselves going broadside to the waves. Not a good experience. In a mile, Jim and I took on water twice. Suddenly all hell broke loose and the wind whipped up to gale fury. Waves started to build up and we were lucky we were so close to the beach because we made a run for it. Thunderstorms were around and the wind probably accompanied a passing storm. The waves were really bad. Give you some idea of our eating habits. July 17th, we went fishing tonight and Don, Don must have brought back 50 pounds of fish, mostly grayling. We usually have fish as the course, uh, but the last day we have not been as lucky. Fish, fish, fish. Our eating routine is usually breakfast at 9 a.m., on the road at 10, lunch which is usually soup at 1 or 2 p.m. and dinner from 9 p.m. On, onwards. At lunch, we ration about one and a half bars of tropical chocolate. And this is our motion snack. Non-traveling days, we get no chocolate. It really helps to have the bars since it can take one's mind off the tedious monotony of paddling, especially on a rough lake with a breeze going against you. And we certainly lived off the land, especially because of our low food situation. On July 18th, Don killed a caribou, and the journal says we feasted ourselves until we were filled, a welcome break from our fish, freeze-dried meals. And then Jim killed another caribou before Grant Lake to supplement our food, but fish were our mainstay item. As a comparison, the, um, the Moffat group, there are six, six of them, uh, they shot five caribou, and not only did they use it for meat, but they also used the hide, 
they they needed some extra protection, presumably against the the cold. We we didn't even consider doing that. And uh, Chant, when he was interviewed for the Riverside Press Enterprise, uh, said on fish, baked, fried, boiled, and dried. It got so bad we gagged at the sight of them. So I hope you uh, are going along on this journey with me. Uh, this was part two. We got up to Cary Lake. Things are going to get interesting at Cary Lake. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, you'll, you, you will see. And uh, we'll continue our journey there on part three.